Hi, everybody. Ooh, hot mic, hot mic. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Ages, and I'm with the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, which, as you know, is the nonprofit that owns the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, presented by Shell. And our job is to use the proceeds from Jazz Fest for programs that we do all year long in the areas of education, economic development, and cultural enrichment. One of those programs is the entertainment industry conference called Sync Up. And I would like to now welcome all of you to the eighth annual edition of the Sync Up conference. This is day two. We had a great day yesterday, and we're looking forward to another great day of stimulating and enlightening panel discussions. So thank you all for being here. Give yourselves a round of applause for getting up early in the morning and coming to edify your brains. So our first topic this morning is touring and specifically working with booking agents. How many performing artists do we have in the room today? Oh yes, healthy smattering. Um, artists often are in want of more work and the folks whose job it is to procure that employment are the booking agents and they're an integral part of the process of keeping bands on the road. And so we've got a great panel of booking agents this morning and I'd like you to welcome Micah Davidson from Blue Mountain Touring. Good morning. Good morning, how's everybody? Alex Kamenschein from Intrepid Artists. Hello. Both of these gentlemen based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hello. And Todd Walker from the Windish Agency. Hello. Based in uh, the, the agency has offices all over, but you're headquartered yeah. in Boston. Yeah. Wait, hello, Frank, how are we doing on Alex? Yeah, testing, Alex, testing. Alex, let's hear it one more time. Hello, test, No, test. nothing? I can share. Okay. Can pass the mic. Pass the Todd mic. Todd and I will both do a little share. Yeah. You're gonna have to freestyle. All right, um, so uh, before we get started, I just wanted to ask you guys to each, if you wouldn't mind, just briefly just kind of talk a little bit about your start in the business, where you came from, how you got interested in music, how you ended up as a booking agent. Todd, since you're on the end, you wanna start? Um, it's a long, uh, sort of weird story, um, but I started in the business when I was 21, and uh, just had a lot of friends that were in bands. And um, I grew up in Boston, and um, used to go to a lot of shows and concerts. And a lot of my friends were in bands, and they said, hey, would you want to book a tour for me? And I said, yeah, sure, you know. Piece uh, of cake, right? I'm, I'm into it, of course, what do, what, what, do I, what do I do? And so I just started picking up the phone and leafing through Polestar and starting to put little regional tours around New England together. And um, some of my first bands were like uh, this band called Lettuce, who was one of my first bands. And Weren't they and just in town last night? Yeah, they were. Yeah. And then uh, Soul Live came through that. And John Brown's Body was another one. And so I just started, you know, I was friends with all these bands and I just started, you know, sort of figuring it out, you know, to the point too where people were like, well, do you need backline on the state? And I was like, they're asking about backline. What, I don't even know what that means, you know? <laughs> um, Are you a musician <laughs> yourself? No, no, sadly. In my heart, I am. <laughs> and in the shower, I sound amazing. You play, you play the radio. <laughs> I do, yeah. yeah. And just very rhythmic inside. But on the outside, not so much. <laughs> um, and then, um, and then we, I had a mutual friend who uh, was tour managing... Um, a tour called Africa Fet, which was like Baba Mall and Taj Mahal, and he introduced me to um, a guy named Scott Southerd, and then I got a job at this place called IMN uh, that was primarily in the performing the International arts. Music Network. International Music Network, and so I was booking, you know, uh, John McLaughlin and Buena Vista Social Club and Caetano Veloso and Gilberto Gil and uh, Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, and it was really a, a, an, an, a, an education for me because music sort of turned into the kind of um, the, the catalyst to really learn about culture and how, what it really means on a global level and, and sort of how I could become, um, you know, part of, 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 you know, raising awareness through music. And but your start in the industry really was booking. I mean, that's really that's what you it. did at the beginning and you, it's carried you all the way through. Absolutely, Interesting. yeah. Yeah, and then uh, recently, three years ago, I kind of had a midlife crisis, uh, not 
really. I mean, midlife You're too crisis. young for a midlife crisis. Talk to me when you get to my age. I know. I'm getting there. I'll have, I'll have a lot of midlife crisis, crises. Um, but then I got a job with this company called the Windish Agency, which is primarily a uh, contemporary agency that uh, represents a lot of DJs and uh, artists like, uh, like Lord and Alt-J. And, and I started a performing arts department within this uh, major agency. And so I'm sort of like the art culture guy in a land of, you know, skinny jeans and ironic beards and <laughs> plaid shirts and the hipsters. All right, So cool. I'm like the non-hipster hipster. <laughs> Alex, how about you? How'd you uh, get launched into this crazy world? All right, well, um, I uh, grew up in Atlanta and went out to the University of Colorado in Boulder for college and uh, always been a music junkie, always enjoyed going to shows and you know, started, uh, had, a, had a friend of mine in college that was actually also from Atlanta. And uh, he, was, he was always into music. He was actually in the uh, acapella, uh, uh, University of Colorado acapella group. And uh, just through knowing people in the scene, um, he started working at a company called Crescendo Artists out of Boulder, Colorado. And I was, I guess, a year or two behind him in school and he was either an assistant agent or I just became an agent, and they were looking for some interns. Uh, and I, I basically came on board as a free intern. I didn't know anything about what it meant to be a booking agent. All I knew was that I enjoyed music and it sounded like a cool job. Uh, and uh, just started you know, helping out with stuff here and there, you know, helping with contracts at first and collecting deposits, all the fun. Uh, <laughs> all the fun administration stuff and then uh, you know one of the guys kind of took me under their wing and uh, allowed me to help book you know book some dates and kind of you know made me an assistant and then uh, one of the agents actually left and moved to another agency out west and then the guy that brought me into the company just d kind of decided that he was more fit to be uh, a performer he didn't he didn't like uh, working on the on the business side and um, I just kind of worked my way up the ladder, and within about a year and a half, I was a full-time uh, booking agent. Um, started work, you know, the, uh, Crescendo worked with a lot of Roots music. We did a lot of bluegrass, uh, Green Sky Bluegrass. We helped Yonder Mountain String Band get their start. Uh, we also worked with a lot of uh, New Orleans bands, like uh, Papa Molly, Henry Butler. Uh, we did some stuff with Deep Banana Blackout and the Wild Magnolias. And then uh, I worked there for about five years. Uh, and then I, I moved over to Intrepid Artists out of Charlotte, North Carolina, just 11 months ago. And that's when I got introduced to the blues. Not that I didn't know about the blues before, but uh, traditionally a, a blues. That's when you got the blues. That's where I got the blues. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, uh, and then uh, here I am. That's about it. All right. And Micah, you grew up wanting to be a rock star. Yes. <laughs> that's that's all. Moving right along. I'm, yeah. uh, no, sorry. Um, uh, well, I actually I actually did, and I, I toured. I'm a bass player, and I toured in bands for about six years. And then, uh, uh, while I was not on the road for a little while, I I kind of walked away from from playing and from the industry for a little while. And I actually was got a job as a bar manager at a golf club, which is obviously way different than being in this industry. Um, but it allowed me to actually have a lot of time to sort of sit around because you only have really at a golf club if you're managing it you only have to really work like three days a week so I missed doing shows and so what I actually did was I got more involved on the scene as far as the local scene was concerned and I started a nonprofit uh, production company called the Carolina Live Music Society and we started producing shows at a lot of shows or a lot at a lot of the venues in in Charlotte and that's kind of how I forced my way in, so to speak, to the, to the industry. I sort of created my own position. Um, and through that, I was working shows throughout, uh, throughout um, Charlotte and a few shows in Asheville and a few shows in Greensboro. And one of the venues decided that they needed a full-time talent buyer, which was a venue called The Double Door. I don't know if any of y'all have heard of it in Charlotte, any of you touring musicians or not, but it's, uh, it's been there for 40 years. I think it's the oldest blues venue in the country under the same owner. 
I don't think it's the oldest blues venue. I think it's the second oldest blues in venue in the country, but it's the oldest one under the same owner. And I ran the club for about five years, and about three years into doing that, um, Hugh Southard, who owns Blue Mountain Artists, which is also based out of Charlotte, uh, called me up and he said, I, I think you'd, you'd be a good asset to the agency, but I'm gonna bring you in as, as an assist, or I'm gonna bring you in as my assistant. So he wanted me to help him with management side of things because I'm a musician and I ran a venue, so I understand that side of the industry and I can speak that kind of lingo, talking about backline and, and, and so on and, and uh, advancing shows and, and promoting shows and all of these different things. And about three months into that, he decided to fire the South, the Deep South agent and uh, he fired him right before Christmas. And so, I don't know, I'm sure you guys can agree to this, that I probably, yeah, well not just that, it's not very fair to him, but that meant that he turned to me and without any booking training of any kind on January, he turned to me and said, by the way, on January 2nd, you're gonna be a full-time agent and we've got 60 bands on our roster and you're gonna handle this entire territory and uh, go. And so, that's how I actually became an agent. And from, uh, January 1st through April, mid-April, I think is probably where we do the majority of the business. So it really was like thrown to the wolves for me to be become an agent. And then about six months into doing that, I was still continuing to run the venue. And six months into do, doing, doing that, I decided I wanted to do something else also. So I started producing festivals. So I produce three festivals a year and I'm an agent. And that's where I'm at. All right. All right. Well. I I'm sure the audience has questions of their own, and I'd like to save as much time as possible to get to those, but I also have quite a few off the top of my head that I would like to try to get to. So the first one is, we have often said, it's kind of a rule of thumb, that it's been harder to get a booking agent than it's been to get a record deal. Do you think that that is still the case? You've been I mean, in this. In is I'm it harder to get signed by an agency than it is to get signed by a record? Even in the label. industry, the I longest mean, it sounds like, I would think that would be a. Yeah, solid I mean, I think agents. I, 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 you know, I don't know. I, I've, I think it's. I think finding an agent and finding a publicist is way more important than finding a record label at this yeah. stage. You know, I mean, the record label's landscape is vastly different. It's going to continue changing. You know, um, in the next sort of five to ten years. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to find a booking agent. I mean. You know, I think some of the key things in finding a booking agent is sort of, you know, um, how does your real, how does your team really, how's it set up? You know, do you have a publicist? Do you have a manager that's on top of stuff? Um, do you have a strategy? You know, I mean, we all work with a million different bands who are pulling us in all different directions and have different, you know, manager um, issues. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let, 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 me put, let me put this another way. Um, Nowadays, with the advent of digital technology and the internet and everything, and the sort of explosion and demise of the, the recorded music industry, maybe it's, if not easier, then more feasible than it's ever been for artists to release their own recordings and distribute them, right? I, I would agree with that, and I think a good, solid example, it would be Snarky Puppy. Uh -huh. Snarky Puppy in the past three years, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with them or not, but I think it's maybe the last three years they went from a band who was playing in a lot of 200 cap rooms to now headlining the jazz tent, you know, at, at Jazz Fest, and they're playing in a thousand cap rooms, and in some venues they're playing in 2,000 cap rooms. And uh, the bass player, who's the leader of the band, started his own label called Ground Up. Now he did it as a division of another age of another label. He went to them and said, "I want to release my own stuff, and I want to start a division, a separate division that also doesn't focus on genres." Right. But that's how, and they've, they've done it through digital media also. Well, okay, so if it's, e if it's easier now or more feasible now, it's not easy, but it's more doable for an artist to get their own recordings out there, is it also true that it's easier for artists to book their own gigs? Uh, I hope not, then we're out of jobs up here. Uh, that's pretty much what I was <laughs> figuring you would say, but I wanted to ask the question anyway. No, I think uh, you know, a lot of like what you know, really helps take a band you know outside of you know their home market onto the national circuit and and getting like the gigs that you know they're looking for outside of the menu venues and whatnot is really you know I'm, I'm not going to say that there aren't promoters that won't deal with agents but I just think or promoters that won't deal with with artists uh -huh. but I just think those artists probably lack those those relationships and those contacts and I think a lot of this 
what it means to be a booking agent and, and getting those gigs when it's you know a very competitive market out there really comes back to having you know that relationship that you've been working on for years dealing with the promoter and he trusts that you know you're gonna bring quality music to him and well is is it that the artists don't have the relationship with the with the talent buyers and promoters or is that the talent buyers and promoters don't want to deal with artists yeah, I think it's a combination of both, you know. But I always try and sort of, especially with new artists. I mean, I think there's a there's a misconception where new artists are sort of like, ah, oh my God, I gotta get a booking agent, and then I'm off to the races. And it's just not like that, you know. We 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 live in a very very saturated marketplace right now, and people are incredibly distracted by so many different new bands and things like this. And I really try and sort of push artists to you know cultivate their own regions and figure out how to book their own stuff and really get a, a good handle on exactly where they fit in this crazy saturated marketplace. Then they can come to you know a, in, in, an agent and say, you know, well this is what we've done and this is what we think we can do. Let's try and figure out how to do it together. You know, I mean I lean on a lot of other elements around the artists, whether it's social media, PR, um, you know, sometimes a record label, you know, whether it be a tiny little record label, to really try and sort of turn each individual gig into uh, an event and really have an impact. Because just gigging nowadays is just a waste of time. And you, you won't find many agents that are going to, you know, sit and just knock out $100 deals for the next, you know, year or two. I mean, it's very hard. I, I, I think there's, to take that a little bit further, I uh -huh. think you also find <laughs> bands that, they want to get an agent, and because they're not willing to do the work, in this day and age, I mean, the economy is bouncing back, and that's fine, but buyers, I think, are still truly basing it solely on what you're doing ticket sales-wise. And if you have digital media behind you, and if you have a whole machine behind you and stuff, when they're buying, especially on a club level, for sure, and I think there's a lot of bands that don't, uh, there are two things to it. I think there's a lot of bands that don't think that those things are important, and then they try and go out in there and they tour, and they don't produce the numbers that they need, and so buyers don't want to either A, have them back, or B, they don't want to pay them the same as what they paid them maybe originally, and so now there's not enough money to go out there, and, and bands think that they're just gonna naturally get out there and, and start making money and things like that, but they have to build a fan base, and if they don't have all those other things in place, Sometimes it makes it harder to do. At the beginning, you said bands, some bands, aren't willing to do the work. Right. So explain more what you mean about the work. Does the, doing the work mean playing shows for no money? No. Uh, the, the work, to me, means, just like Todd was saying, have, have a strategy. You have to have a marketing plan, and not just rely on the venue to be the only ones marketing the show. You have to figure out, I mean, in this day and age, you got to do Twitter and Facebook and maybe Foursquare, and I don't really know. I mean, there's, there's so it always seems the like there's new digital. The, the there's promotional work to make sure that your shows are successful and taking that promotional responsibility work, on yourself but and not leave it to the promoter. But it's, it's not just that. It's also when you, when you get to that town, the fans that you do get into that show, you don't just engage them on a music level and on a personal level. You have to get them to also make sure you're talking about your CDs, make sure you're talking about your mailing list, get these people signed up to your mailing list, get actually use your mailing list that you've built. Like there has to be marketing that goes out. There has to be management that goes out. There has to be communication with the venues. How is the show going? It's not going well. Let's put more marketing behind these shows. And I don't, I, I think a lot of baby bands think that just because you get an agent, all of these things are just gonna fall into place. But there has to be, you know, each guy in the band, if you've got a band of five guys and two guys are doing all the work and the other guys are showing up and playing the shows, you're missing out. So I think we can all agree that the booking agent's job is very, very difficult, especially if you're working with an artist that isn't very well known outside their home market. And people look to you to be the one to sell the talent buyer. And to, because of your relationships, uh, you can call up somebody at a club in a town where they've never been or a festival where they've never performed and say, hey, yeah, I know you've got one of my bigger acts on your, uh, you know, they're playing there next month or you're on the festival and, and why don't you also try one of these other acts that, that are on my roster and I think they're going to do a great job for you and then the, the act is trusting that you're going to be able to leverage your relationship into an opportunity that they wouldn't have been able to convert on their own, right? And but so when you do that, w I think we all know that it takes just as much work to crank out an offer for a $500 gig on a Wednesday as it is 
to, to generate an offer for a $5,000 gig at a festival on a Saturday somewhere. So can you just talk and explain to us a little bit more about what makes that so hard? Why is it so hard to get that $500 Wednesday gig just as hard as the $5,000 festival gig? What are some of the steps in your process from initial conversation to offer to actually converting something? I mean, is it because the talent buyers are just so busy or flaky or both that they're just not paying attention to what you're saying or are there other factors at work? I, I, I think some of it is just about building your relationship with your buyer um, and, and I think these guys would agree to that. Like, if I call, well, I'll use you as an example. <laughs> okay. Scott, who is a buyer for the Crescent City Barbecue and Blues Festival here. You and I have known each other for a while. You have worked with Blue Mountain even before I got there for a while. And a lot of times, you and I would get on the phone and we'll talk about bands that I don't even represent. You know, I learn more about what is it that you are looking for on your event. And clubs, the same situation. When I first meet uh, or talk to a buyer that I've never worked with, I talk to them about who are the other, I try to look at their website as well, but I talk to them about who, who are the other bands that they're bringing through the area and think mindfully about the kind of bands that make sense to go in their venue. And once you develop the relationship, and I think you, you make sure that, and maybe I'm speaking that from a fellow buyer as well, who used to do it and still sort of does it with festivals, but I think about what they're looking for, so that way I know what I think they'll get excited about. And I think that's, that's a big component of it also, is making sure that you build that relationship, because I think it's easier to get those 500 gigs. Well, why don't gigs. you take it a step further? Why don't you use a real example? Let's talk about one of the acts that you represent, Jureka Singleton. Okay. How long have you been hitting me up to book this guy? How long have you been trying to convert this show? Uh, well, let's see. January, I guess? Because you and... Longer? Okay. So, see, there you go. He's... He, how long what have you been doing? What's gone into it? Come on, talk about well, it. Well, okay. So... Persistence. Per, there's, there's persistence, and I'm... Uh, I know you're going to ask me a question a little bit, or you're going to ask us a question a little bit later, and I'm going to sort of turn it back on you again, but... <laughs> Um, this, this guy, Jerika Singleton, who is a great, amazing talent, who's actually playing Jazz Fest next Friday um, over in the Blues Tent. He's based out of Mississippi. Until last May, no one had, he'd played Mississippi and he'd played the Chicago Blues Festival. No one had ever heard of him anywhere. Bruce Ziglauer from Alligator Records had seen him, thought he was amazing, decided to sign him. He came to us, Bruce came to us and said, hey, would you guys at Blue Mountain be interested in rep representing this guy? And we listen to him, and, and I'll be honest, I have, we do all of our booking at my agency based on territory, so we all represent everybody on the roster, but I only do all of the shows that are based in my territory. And I happen to also have more bands that live in my territory than anybody else does in the agency. So I have to be more mindful about who I'm willing to sign and when I'm willing to sign them and all of these things, because I have to make sure that I can actually, they're gonna be playing more often in my particular territory, because that's where they live. Jerikas being a, so much of an unknown, I was real leery about actually signing him. We signed him, and because I just wasn't sure if I would have the time to be able to put into it. We signed him, and I finally got to see this kid play, and my jaw, it's wonderful. I, I, I don't, we all get tossed bands all the time, and I think there's probably a small percentage where you're literally like, I cannot believe how, how amazing this kid is. And so I, th I think it was after Jazz Fest that we confirmed him on Jazz Fest, but I reached out to you and I said, listen, I don't know, who, I don't know when you're starting. I know you usually start around January-ish, but here's a kid you gotta check out. I'm gonna send you videos on this. You really need to get behind him. Give me, I think I popped you an email first and I said, give me a call. I wanna explain this guy to you over the phone. And I think that's a different component that agents get to do that bands wouldn't normally get to do is we get to, we get to, be pumped up and then get you on the phone and you get to hear how excited we are about this and I think that makes a big difference and so I called you and I said look here's videos you got to check this guy out by the way Jazz Fest has him also I've got him playing with the funky meters in January you need to go check out the show and I'm gonna just continue to basically bombard you with information on on this guy until you cave exactly <laughs> and so and then he was coming through town yeah. he was on a show at Tipitina's yep. and somehow I managed to get my ass out the door and actually get to the venue. And lo and behold, he was great. And I was blown away. It's like, oh, awesome. 
And so you know I like him. Yeah. And you know, and so you're thinking, oh, okay, well, he's going to hire my act, right? Have you gotten an offer yet? I have not gotten an offer. Right. And, and That's he my is, point. As, <laughs> as, of, as of two weeks ago, he's, he's, he, Scott had me hold, I think, three different, one, three different artists on my roster for the festival, and I'm still waiting on an offer. And I, I figured I'd see you. Maybe I'd give you a little nudge with the shoulder. So I, I, think, I think after I think this I'm panel, you're going to get well. an offer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so, Are those in our bags, by the way? Did, did you slide those? Was the offer no, that's no, just cash. Oh, uh, okay. All right. So I want to go back to your worry. comment, too, about sort of like, why is it so hard yeah. to put these things together? It's really not that hard, though, to put these tours together. I mean, I can put a tour together for you 50 dates in the next week, no problem. And for all me, the different rooms. as an sure. artist? Your trio, whatever you do, awesome. because we have those relationships with all these people for. that are like, sure, of course, like I'm, you're feeling it, like I'm in. We've had n uh, numerous examples of you know why I trust you. We have those relationships, but if we put a tour together and nobody comes, then a it sort of screws up my relationship as far as trust and the you know reliance that that tr that talent buyer has on me, and it sort of you know people have short attention spans, so that you're you know the the Scott trio is not going to be touring too much longer because it's like. Oh man, you you know he didn't really sell tickets, you know, and we can leverage opportunities. But we're at so festivals. good. Why aren't we selling tickets? I, man, if if I could, if if everything <laughs> was based on being so good, I'd be a really rich man. But, um, you know, we can definitely leverage opportunities. You know, like the the jazz festival. You know, um, I've got like Cassandra Wilson, you know, playing this Billy Holiday thing, and then that conversation turned into like you know. Um, do you have anything, you know, Mexican? Do you have a, you know, anything of this sort of like heritage? And then that turned into a La Santa Cecilia of conversation, you know? So we have these relationships that we can continue leveraging, but, but again, you know, we, can, we, we create opportunities, but it's not really our job to, re to, to assure their success. What is the hardest part of your job? The level of emails nowadays is like insane. My wife calls my phone my mistress. Yeah. It's it's terrible. It's like it's out of control. But what you know whatever. We just always email. Alex, what's what what's the difference between a good day and a bad day? What what make what makes life either enjoyable or miserable? Well, it depends if I if I got the uh, the phone call with the $10,000 offer or the phone call saying the $10,000 offer has been canceled. Um, you know, a lot of times dealing with uh, new festivals and new buyers, it's a, it's a lot of persistence that goes into it. It can be very frustrating. Um, not everyone um, is the most, you know, professional. Um, you know, dealing with different size venues, different types of, of, of promoters. Um, you, there's a lot, of, a lot of characters that you have to deal with. How do you straddle the line between persistence and being a pain in the ass? Oh, I'm a big pain in the ass. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to bring that up, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I, I, how do you, d and go I ahead. Think, I think that is where, like, you know, I, I kind of feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I use, like, maybe, maybe we all, all good agents do, but I use, like, an, an, old, an older school kind of method where I balance my emails with, with phone calls. Like, I feel like if, if I'm frustrated about uh, the way a deal went or something, I can express that frustration over a phone call without burning a bridge or being misinterpreted over, over text on an email. I think sometimes emails can be misinterpreted and uh, there's like a, a, a tone you can use in a phone call that can kind of help kind of bridge that gap. That is definitely a, a, a quickly dying art is knowing the, when it's right to send an email, when it's right to pick up the phone when it's right to have a face-to-face -face and understanding that the, the level of complexity that's quickly dying. Well, uh, go ahead. So this was the question I was gonna turn back around on you, yes. so I know, I know you know this. What, as, as, a, as a buyer, for all the bands that either A, don't have an agent or, um, or do have an agent and aren't sure how their agent does things, as a buyer, how do you feel, like how do you judge, are there, I would assume, depending on your relationship with the agent, will also affect how you feel about their persistency. You know, if there's somebody who you, you've got a really good, solid working relationship, whether they email you once a day or 12 times a day or 12 times a week or whatever it may be, how do you feel about that? I respect persistence. And I, and I recognize that folks are trying to do their jobs. Um, it, it goes into that relationship, and I want to talk a little bit more about how to develop that relationship as well. Um, and I, it, 
it's, for me, as a buyer, I try to provide as much information as I can on the status of the deal, you know? And I'll tell you, I'll be candid with you, I'm waiting for a committee to sign off on this, or I'm waiting for a budget to be approved before I can submit these offers or something. I've got roadblocks that I have to deal with that are preventing you from getting the information that you need. So I try to provide that. I, how you react to that tells me about you and how I want to, uh, and how I'm gonna perceive you. And, um, and my perception of you has a lot to do with uh, that relationship. And, and it's not whether or not I'm gonna wanna book the band, but it's, it just goes into how I think we're gonna work together in the long term. Like, I guess what I'm thinking in my mind is, I would rather get an email from an agent that is waiting on an offer every week or every two weeks or once a month, so I know that they're following up and just doing their job. I would prefer that to one email once every three months or six months from an agent that I never hear from and then just all of a sudden out of the blue is like, hey, whatever happened to that offer? I'm like, huh? I thought you forgot about me a long time ago. So. But I was, but I was first told. <laughs> and then you oh, disappeared, oh and I never heard from you again. Oh so, so, so it's it's a two-way street. So this this gets into another bit. Um, how do you develop a relationship with a buyer over email? Somebody that you've never met. You know, we hadn't really lots met each of, other face to face. Lots of uh, exclamation points and smiley faces. <laughs> um, because you're trying to strike, you're talking, the, you're talking the difficulty of, of maintaining that balance between persistence and being a real pain and striking the right tone. And that's a hard thing to judge. You're trying to pick up clues for me on how often is the right time to hit me up? When is the best time to hit me up? And, and if, if you get me in January, am I already booked? Or am I not even thinking about that event because I've got four other events in the queue ahead of it that I've got to deal with? How, how do you know how to approach people? I mean, I have, I definitely have many, I have people that I work with that I've never spoken to on the phone that just won't pick up the phone or uh -huh. that's just the best way that they uh, like to handle their business. Um, but yeah, it's just like, again, picking up clues and trying to sort of do a little bit more research in my due diligence before I go in and kind of pitch something. You know, if I am pitching a African artist to a, you know, a blues festival, they're sort of like, well, why are you hitting me like this? And right. they almost sort of, you know, are a little bit taken aback that you like you didn't do the research and things like that. So, I really try and sort of put a lot of effort into uh, you know understanding right. what they program, what do they do, what really works, what doesn't work for them. Right. So stay really focused. When was the last time you signed an artist? This morning? No. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, like I don't know, this week, this morning. So, what were some of the factors that went into that decision on why, why not, what made you interested? Uh, well, we just signed, it was, it was actually last week, I just signed this guy named Phil Cook that used to be in this band called Megaphon, and um, he has a really great manager um, that has another really great roster of artists like, uh, like Bon Iver, bon Iver and, and, and Sylvan Esso, and, and so he hit us up because Phil's work, you know, my touring strategy, I have a little bit of a niche where I kind of work artists in the performing arts world and then also in the commercial world and try and sort of have a really diverse approach on where and how I book artists. So, you know, somebody recommended me and said I was probably the best bet for that particular artist and, and we and we worked, he sent me the record and it was incredible and I said, let's, let's do this. And you know? that was enough and he just has to a great plan. record? There had to be well, more to go into the decision than that. Well, he has a great manager. He, the rec, well, first and foremost, the record like slayed me, you know? And I really was a big fan of Megaphone, you know, um, back in the day. And, you know, it sort of has that kind of like Americana, indie Americana kind of vibe to it, you know? Do you so have to be in love with the music fit. before you'll think about an artist? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm not just gonna sign something because some big wig manager and some, you know, big wig label was like, you gotta do this. You know, but if you're not a metal guy, I mean, and... I don't think a metal, I mean, that's when I'm sort of like, why would you call me? Like, right. look at my roster, I have nothing to do with metal. I mean, I mean, I get the let out every now and then, believe it, <laughs> but, you know. Are you cool with yeah. signing a band that doesn't have a manager? 
It's hard. I it's it's hard for me. I do have artists that don't have managers, but I feel like a manager is, you know, a manager is a really great navigator and an artist is an artist, you know? And I think that when you can keep your focus on the art and then the manager can sort of like oversee some of the strategy and things like that, it's it's sort of a better working relationship. Alex, do you, do you have to love the music before you'll c even consider signing a band? Uh, yeah, for me, yeah. Um, you know, I like to work with, you know, music that I feel confident about, and uh, it definitely helps me sell a band that I, that I believe in, you know, has what it takes uh, musically. Uh, it's also important for me that the, that the people are, you know, good people. Um, you know, it's a long-term relationship, and uh, if they aren't managed, um, you know, we do work with a, a, a couple of bands that don't have a, like an outside manager, but they all have like a band leader that sort of assumes that role and, and does a good job wearing that hat um, and can kind of help steer the ship. When was the last time you signed an act? Uh, earlier, I guess it was probably, we signed a few this quarter. I, I, I'd say the most recent one was a band that actually I, I re-signed. Um, at the beginning of this year, a band called The Congress. I worked with them at Crescendo, and then I left Crescendo, and then they, they actually followed me over to Intrepid. And uh, Good for you. Yeah. That's great. When was the last time that you were considering signing an act and ultimately passed? What were some of the factors that tipped the, the scale in favor of not going with that artist? I mean, we get you know submissions and, and we have conversations about signing bands all the time. Um, it could go on what Todd was saying, that it just doesn't work with our genre. I don't feel like I'm the best agent for... No, I mean, somebody that you were, like, really looking at. Okay. You know, and you were really seriously considering it, and then ultimately you were like, you know what? I, I, I don't think so. Micah? Um, well... You don't have to name names, but just talk about the there's circumstance. Uh, there, there's a certain artist that... All right, who was it? That... No. that <laughs> that I will not name, um, but uh, this was actually something that would have been a re-sign because we had worked with this person in the past, this band in the past, and- So you knew what you'd be getting into. I knew what I'd be getting into, and they came back to us to some extent with their tail between their legs, if you, so to speak, but um, they came back to us, and, and they're actually a band, they're, they're a really, really great band, and they make pretty good money but they don't have a proper manager, they don't have proper social media and all of those things and marketing behind them, and they themselves are somewhat of a cluster, and there's a, just drama constantly around it, and it's so one of those things where- So they're just a mess. Too it, many, it, too it, many cooks in the kitchen. It, it's, it's, not even, it's not even that, it's literally almost like if, it's a prime example of somebody standing in their own way, and they know how good they are, but they refuse to listen to anybody else, and they want to do things their own way, and they're the only, they're the real reason why they continue to sort of fall, so to speak. And, and so you said to them, there's this great agency in the same town called Intrepid. You guys yes, really call that? Yes. Actually, I sent them to Piedmont, <laughs> I think. Um, I think, yeah. Um, That's an inside when it's, joke. When it's, when it's somebody who I, we really don't like, we send them to, to Piedmont. Okay. We don't send them to Intrepid. Um, but it's... Uh, no, but the fact is that you were like, uh, Well, yeah, away. because, because it, you have to realize that, that besides all of these other issues that go on, you have to think about how much time is it going to take, how much time is it going to take away from all of the artists who are either A, doing things right, or doing things a lot more right than that particular artist. And if I'm going to spend half of my day, you asked the question earlier, what's the difference between a good day and a bad day? And I don't think there's a, an easy way to answer that question because... Uh, your best day in the world could totally flip on its head at the you know at five o'clock before you leave the office or something like that. But I, th I think you have to think about how are you best as an agent. How am I best going to be served managing my time throughout my entire roster? Whether you've got one band or you've got twelve bands, you know, or sixty bands or whatever. I, I think you have to think about that. And so when when we looked at this artist, we we realized that we spent so much time talking about all of these issues that the artist had when we used to work with them that it didn't make any sense. We knew it was just going to take too much time to deal with it now. Do any of y'all have any questions? If you do, use the microphone, please. Anybody? All right, well, while we're 
Waiting for somebody to be brave. Todd, I want to ask you, when was the last time that you were seriously considering a band and ultimately elected not to sign them? Yeah, I, last week I passed on a band that I, like, I just loved, and they're awesome, and they've got this incredible manager, and the team's all there, and it just, for me, it, it, was, it was a band that was going to need a lot of attention, and I just... I'm trying to get more honest with myself on like how, what kind of time I had. And I just, the more I thought about it, I was like, I just, I don't have the time. And I rely on like, I've like, a, you know, my assistants and stuff like that that go out and, and really help to get holds and stuff like that and route stuff. And it's, there's, it's, it was just too much. So I, I sat, I like, I, it was just painful because I like love this band. How did, do and they like one of you guys should definitely sign them. <laughs> they're How sick. do they do financially? We'll do them, th th what, what, what's like an they're average? They're big. I mean, they're like blowing up in like their own country right now, but it hasn't really happened over here, you know? So, you know, I mean, I don't know. So it, it would have been happen. a total development project in this country? Yeah, not a total, but just a lot of work, you know? And a lot I, of work to get a thousand dollar offer yeah, in the third yeah, market somewhere. Yeah, and like I'm in the middle of a little bit of, I need to drop some, some bands right now. My boss is on a tear. He's like, we gotta drop some bands. So I'm focused on dropping some bands right now. You know. So how are you gonna decide which bands to drop? Is it the ones who, who make the least amount of money, or the ones who are the biggest pain no, in the ass to deal with? No, it definitely never comes down. I mean, I have bands that make nothing, and then bands that make a lot of money, but it never 100% comes down to money. It's sort of like, is it really working? Is this really working? I mean, if we are gonna get really honest with each other. And you know, if I've been working with a band for a year, maybe two years or something, and, and it's been sort of steady or it's dipped a little bit, um, I, you know, it's sort of like, let's be honest, it's, just, it's not there, you know? And is anything gonna change? Maybe, but right now, you know, it's a little bit of a time suck, so I, I can't really spend the time, you know? Hi. Hello, Scott. Um, all right, so nice you- Nice shorts. You, thank you, thank you. The shoes are better. They, they are. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're kind of jazz festy. Um, so you have a, a roster of artists. You sign artists along the way. You, you hold uh, artists previously signed. You, you sign new ones. And everybody expects kind of the same level of attention, and everybody thinks that their own product or their own uh, sound is, is something that they want to see put out there, not to the detriment of the other artists, but they want that same level of focus. Um, and then you see some agencies where you'll see the same artists booked over and over and over again at festivals all around the country, whatever, and, uh, or venues, and other artists that seem to kind of just sit there on, on their rosters. And maybe that's what you're talking about when it, it, maybe it's time to call the herd and to, and to kind of thin, thin out a little bit. But at what point, or is, is it a balancing act to, to giving that level of attention to all of your artists versus a, something that an artist might perceive as a conflict of interest and say, well, hey, my sound is similar to this sound, but you're really focusing on them and you're not giving me the attention I deserve. How do you, how do you deal with hurt feelings, with perception of conflict of interest and the, that want of attention? Tough question. I, I definitely think it's a balancing act, um, for sure, and I, and I think it's a tough question to to really be able to answer because you never want to go to your band and say nobody wants you because to some extent I hate to say it but to some extent it's it's a lot of it is the market driving itself on some of that level where if you have one band that's in the same genre you have two bands that are in the same genre and one band is totally out there playing and the other one isn't. This is a good example that I can give Dave Matthews and Agents of Good Roots. And I don't know how many of you guys have ever heard of the band Agents of Good Roots. Probably not a lot of y'all. They're both from Virginia. Years ago, before Dave Matthews broke, Agents of Good Roots and Dave Matthews were breaking at the exact same time. Corin Capshaw was looking to sign one of the two of them, and I actually think he actually signed both of them for a little while. But the reality is, is only one of them is going to break. And the market dictated which one broke, and it obviously was Dave Matthews. And I think it's just as much our job to find a way to communicate that to some extent to our artists. I, I, I try to be honest with, with the artists as well as myself. And I'm not saying it's totally their fault. It's a balancing act for us. We have to be out there making sure that all of the artists on our roster 
And, and I think sometimes it's good to sort of take a step back and say, maybe we have too many people at the moment and you should go somewhere else because we don't have the time to give you. And there are smaller agencies out there that are just as good, just because it's a smaller agency doesn't make mean that it's not as good an agency. To some extent, depending on the artist, a smaller agency is exactly where they need to be because they can get more focus. So I don't know if that sort of helps or if y'all How do you feel that? about artists having multiple non-exclusive agents? Is there ever a situation when that's a good thing? No, never. <laughs> no. It's, it's too confusing. I mean, I think it's an, we can say just no, never, and, and that's the truth, but it, it really does get too confusing. And, and it's unfortunately on the lower level a common practice where a band will even try and get an agent and say, so listen, we want you to represent us, but we want to still do all of the booking for this particular territory, or we get this room and this festival and this, and it becomes confusing. Or I, I bet I'm still going to book my local gigs. Exactly. So all you of can't those book things. anything in my town. And it, I'm and still going to book all the high-paying gigs. But yes. But you can work on all the $250 to $500. Yes. Products. It's 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 too much of a cluster, and 90% of the agents out there are going to tell you no, thank you. How about letting letting you handle the U.S. and they have another agent that handles Europe? Yeah, that's I mean a little that's different. different. I mean, we do oversee stuff at Intrepid. Um, we are an all-encompassing, you know, international agency, but. I feel like the international like versus U.S., that's a little different. There are a lot of bands that have an overseas agent and a U.S. agent. And you don't really, you know, you, you, your paths don't cross as much. If you're sharing territories with other agents, then it's different. But if it's clearly cut, um, it's, it's, that's okay. Hi. Hi. Um, quick question. Is there a directory of some sort that you folks use to, to find buyers like Scott? Or things Pole like star. that, or, yeah. or is it you know, Pole star. and just basically that's it. And also our, the question to him, uh, to Scott here, um, do you talk to other people other than these kind of guys, uh, or you know what I'm saying? Do you talk to regular artists, or you know what I'm saying, as far as them trying to get on, you know, on some of the gigs that you might have? You mean in in terms of booking, like booking do, do I accept submissions from artists directly? Is that what right, you're right? Right. Other than yeah, other than you want to yes, do. absolutely. I, you know, bands contact me. Bands that don't have agents contact me constantly. And I do they have a shot? Absolutely. I, I book bands without agents all the time because the events that I do are all roots right, events right, right. that are 90% local talent. Okay. 99% of whom have no agent. So, <laughs> so, so that, that, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But, but there's a big difference between those who come correct and those who don't. Okay, and what is that? Well, some, I mean, the, I keep a file of the most hideous uh, <laughs> of, uh, b gig solicitation requests, and because they come in 50 a day. It's like, really? Hey, I want to get on your festival. End. <laughs> and your name is, and the kind of music you play is, right, right, and you right. do what? Do you have any idea what kind of event that I do? And then there are some that, that send something that is really concise and to the point, and it's got a YouTube link and a SoundCloud link and a okay. list of other places of, of similar size. So those are the things that you're looking for, And basically. then the other, well, for me, it's mostly is it in the genre okay. that the event is, because my events are all genre specific? Is it in the price range that I can afford? Do they have any name recognition whatsoever? Because all things being equal, I'm looking to look for somebody that's gonna draw more people. Exactly. Um, and the, and, but basically it comes down to whether they present themselves with any semblance of professionalism versus those who don't, which are the majority. Oh, really? Thank you. Um, one thing I want to add, it's, it's, it hasn't been a topic of question necessarily, but to all of those bands that are in here or on the webcast who aren't in here but are paying attention and listening, it's, it's not, Todd sort of touched on this a little bit, it's, it's not always about the money and we try to not necessarily make it about the money, we want to make sure we're fans of the music for sure, but if you don't have a manager, one thing to definitely look at is we're going to ask you guys for tour history and a band most of the time looks at us and they're like, I don't know what that means. You, you guys, uh, for us, we have a certain level that we, we don't always stick to this. Jerika Singleton is a prime example of, of us not sticking to it, but we have a certain criteria that we try to sort of stick with when we're trying to sign somebody. One of the things we ask for is two years of financial tour history so we can see how much money you're actually making. You guys need to be keeping certain documents, uh, you know, keep spreadsheets that keep track of what your guarantee was for that show, what the name of the event was, the market, if it's a venue, 
Did you guys get a guarantee with some kind of a back end deal? What is your total attendance? What is your total walk money? All of these different things you guys need to be making sure you're keeping track of because when an agent, especially one who's looking for somebody who has a manager especially to reach out for us, if you're reaching out on your own and we ask for those things and you're like, oh, I don't have that, that's gonna show us a certain level of right out the gate, a certain level of professionality and how serious you guys take this because as great as it is for a band to go out there and, and, and play great music, it's still a business and if it's not run as a business, there's a lot of things that will just constantly fall to the wayside. And so I, I thought I would at least mention that just in case as you guys are trying to shop yourselves for agents and stuff like that, that is something that we, we do ask for and a lot of people don't think about it. So when I was managing bands many years ago and trying to get agents for those bands, that was, what, that was question number one. Let's see the tour history. So let's see the list of places that you played, how much you made at each one. So is that still going to be like deciding factor number one. If somebody, if there's an artist that you see at a club and you love them and you think they're great and you give them a business card and they call you, are you gonna say, okay, great, I loved your band, let's see the tour history? Uh, yeah, um, it's, it's definitely one of the first questions we ask. And um, if they haven't played anywhere but Uptown, <laughs> did, have, they, have they got a shot? I, I mean, um, you know, there, there there are definitely some bands that, that I've signed, you know, where it w really they, they came in at, at ground zero. Um, but it's it's a lot of work. It's 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 a lot of work regardless. Um, it, it definitely helps you, you know, it, it not only to be a, a, a good band, but also to have somewhat of a level of establishment before you become on certain agents' radar. I mean, and then there's, you know, the bigger agents that won't even consider looking at you until you know you you're doing certain numbers or you're doing uh, you know certain revenue and stuff so yeah I mean there's there's all all levels of the spectrum I feel like but it's not it's not the driving I, I don't I, I agree with with Todd and I know Alex thinks this as well it's not the 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 end-all be-all situation I mean a, a good example for me at least would be ear funk is a band from here that when they they actually approached me and I passed on them twice and why? I, I didn't think they were ready. I honestly did not think that they were ready yet. Meaning I was looking that they at hadn't their numbers. toured enough places? I was, they hadn't toured enough places. They weren't quite doing the numbers. They were still growing even inside of New Orleans. And I happened to be down here for a Mardi Gras. And all, because I live in Charlotte, I, obviously any of us can only go see a band so often. And I think I, I didn't have the opportunity to really see them. I saw some YouTube stuff and I heard some music and it, and it was okay, but it didn't grab me quite yet. And I had the opportunity to actually come down to New Orleans and see them. And it was at 3 in the morning. And there wasn't many people at the show because it was 3 in the morning. I think it was during Mardi Gras. And I turned to their manager three songs in and I said, I want this band. I want this band bad. Had their tour history or their average gross changed that much that it was suddenly no. financially feasible? It actually hadn't changed that much at all. And it had nothing, to, at that point, it had nothing to do with financial. So it's it had just, to a, do with just a feel and a vibe and you fell in love. This is a band that I think has something special. And I want to work with them. And I signed them right there on the spot. So, so and I, it's I not about the money. I, I stole them from Alex's agency. <laughs> Good for you. Thanks. You sure about that? Yeah. Hey, you how you doing? Though. Good. You weren't doing So question I have actually is kind of related to that. Are you pretty much, I guess this is for all of you, but are you um, typically so busy that you pretty much only have time to deal with bands who are out there shopping or are you kind of going the other way and also looking for bands at all too? Yeah, I'd say it's a, a combination of both. I have a follow up too. Oh. Fiona, go ahead. A uh, combination of both. I mean, I'm, we're all music lovers and I, you know, I do an insane amount of mu listening and research and there's I've got certain blogs that I read regularly and I find new bands all the time I mean I've definitely signed things that have sort of popped up on you know some blog that I was looking at and I loved it and explored it and met the manager and you know and signed them down the road and stuff like that but yeah and then there obviously a lot of stuff is sent you know um, and then when it comes to festivals if let's say you have kind of a new festival, is it usually promoters coming to you first looking for bands or is it booking agents going to promoters to try to get their bands in? Uh, hopefully it's, it's going both ways. Um, you know, if, if all the bands you represent, if you're not getting any phone calls for the bands you represent, you're the, you're the one making all the calls for the promoters, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, 
So yeah, ideally, you know, some, some promoters will, will put their wish list together and they'll start with that, you know, and they'll start with their headliners and their bigger names and they'll go after the bands that they want for their festival. And then if they're not available, um, they might have a, a plan B or a plan C, but at the same time, you know, that's when, you know, w when we make that phone call or we submit that email, you know, they might, you know, you know, consider us for some of these other slots or if, if their, you know, A guy wasn't available or, you know, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it goes both ways, absolutely. I mean, usually for us, we decide who we want and then figure out who the agent is for that artist. And very rarely is it, all right, who have you got in this price range? Right. Very rarely, but it does happen every once in a while. Uh, I'm just curious about the size of your operation. Is it like mostly one man, or if there are other players, you know, what kind of um, responsibilities do they have? You know? The size of the, of the agency? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I can't speak on, I know you got a pretty, pretty big operation over there. Intrepid, we have uh, three U.S. agents, and we do everything by territory. Me and two other agents do everything in the U.S., and then we have two guys that do everything overseas, and then we have some people that help with like uh, you know contracts and do more like office management stuff. Um, we have about 40 or so very actively touring bands. Uh, they're all you know working either doing big tours and, and when they're not touring, you know they want to be working at least you know three four days a week. Uh, so that's yeah that's the size of, of Intrepid. Were you were you also asking about what size of the artist we're looking or you were asking about the agency? Okay. Hey, yeah. go ahead. Good morning, everybody. S Scott, Alex, Todd, Michael. Uh, I'm James Alexander from Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, I'd just like to know uh, what viewpoint would you guys take on a band that doesn't have a manager, agent, or anything that does all of that stuff themselves? And, uh, you know, we we're trying to expand our horizon. Uh, we really not that interested in signing with an agent, but but if it comes to that, you know, we will. So I just want to know uh, your take well, on this all of that. This is the booking agent panel. You know that, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think I, I think I remember that. I remember <laughs> it is the booking agent panel. And um, while I'm on that, uh, Michael, you know, we have something in common anyway. He's a bass player, and I'm a bass player, so you know, I know we gonna get along just fine. <laughs> Um, uh, it, you're, to some extent, you were sort of answering your own question from a standpoint of if you're a band who does everything yourself and you're not interested in talking, you're not interested in working with an agent. Hey, hey, I, hey, I, I, didn't, I didn't really say that. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying I, you I, I said that, but <laughs> I may be, I may be contradicting myself. Well, it, I, I, we've all sort of touched on it a little bit. I think we all work with a few bands that don't have managers and they don't have publicists and stuff. They do everything their own in-house. So it's not impossible for us to decide to work with something uh, with a band that doesn't have all of those different components. I, I think that there's a lot of bands that we do that with that we, we get behind them because we believe in them, but it also, I think that there's just sort of an inherent teaching aspect that we, we enjoy helping them grow to that next level and helping them understand the business a little better because we see enough promise in what they're doing already that we think with our help and advice and we can help you guys get further along. Um, I think, I, I, I do think that if you're a band, it's gonna be a very, 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 very rare situation where a band can do literally everything themselves without a manager, without a publicist, without an agent, without a label, without all of these things and get to a point where they really should be, so to speak. You know, I think they're gonna always hit a wall as far as their growth. That's why I'm here. <laughs> all right, well guys, I really would love to be able to ask you a lot more questions about all of this and get into the ins and outs of why you sign bands and why you don't, but unfortunately we're out of time for this session. We've gotta move on to our next panel, so I'd like everybody to please give a big round of applause to Todd Walker from the Windus Agency, Alex Kamenschein from Intrepid Artists, and Micah Davidson from Blue Mountain Artists. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.